Greetings. So this week we are going out of the Spanish Golden Age and into French neoclassicism. Now, we just were in the Spanish Golden Age of theater and um, we read Life is a Dream. And in it, Segismundo says, all we possess on earth means nil, for life's a dream. Think what you will, and even our dreams are dreams. We had some really interesting discussion posts this past week based off of that prompt, that question of the title, life is a dream, what might that mean? Um, it's very interesting, but in Spanish, golden age theater, we have some things that are very important. One is honor, which we see a lot in Life as a Dream. Um, the honor of marriage, um, the honor of a past marriage, the locket, right, which is, which is honor in itself, um, the honor of a father, and the honor of a king to his son. So this idea of honor is very big in Spanish golden age drama. We also have a connection to religion and Christianity. Uh, again, at this time, the Spanish Inquisition is going around as well. And um, Clotado has this Christian sen sentiment, right? Um, that a prudent man might easily emerge victorious over his fate. And his fate, as Segismundo had said before, is my first sin was being born, which is very much a Christian doctrine, right? The idea of like original sin. So we have in Life is a Dream, obviously a connection to religious scripture, right? Um, we're moving now into France, which is based on some history that you'll see in a PowerPoint coming up in this video. Um, is moving away from the religious. In fact, they're going into this age of enlightenment is what they call it. And we'll explore some of the history there. Um, since we're moving into France and away from honor, I'm gonna let down my hair so I can enjoy some of the freedoms of the time. We're going to be playing with uh, the history time period of Louis XIV. And uh, King Louis XIV is known as the Sun King. He's known as the Sun King. There's a lot of theories of why he's known as the Sun King. Some say that when he was a young child, he played a son in a ballet and decided to be known as the Sun King off of that. We know that he took the sun as his personal symbol. Um, others say that his brilliance at court was so radiant it was like the sun. But in many cases he's uh, compared to the Greek god Apollo, who is the god of the sun. And he is a great patron to the arts. And hair goals, Louis XIV, long hair is in. So let's explore the enlightenment in this PowerPoint coming up, and then you get to read a satire by Moliere. And you'll learn a little bit of Moliere's history in this PowerPoint coming up as well. So enjoy this next foray into French theater history. Here we go. In this lecture, we are exploring late 17th century French drama and the play Tartuffe by Moliere. Uh, during this period of time, it's known as the Enlightenment. Um, the Enlightenment is named that way because that is the philosophical, rational, and scientific spirit of the age. The Enlightenment also has another name, which is the Age of Reason. Perhaps because they thought that they were basing everything upon reason. Let's explore that a bit. So, alternative names for the Enlightenment. One we know which is the Age of Reason, which we just went over. Um, another is neoclassicism, as you saw in the previous video, the new classics. Why is it the new classics? They're going back to this spirit of ancient classical thinking and literature, um, pulling from Aristotle of the Greeks, and they pull 
uh, the rules of neoclassicism, which we will go over, and they are saying that this is how we get to truth or verisimilitude. It's called the age of reason because reason is the prevailing idea of the period. It is getting out of what they consider darker thinking. That's why we call it the enlightenment, right? Um, so out of these thoughts that they believe were not based on reason and into reason. And we'll discuss why. Why is reason so important based on the history of the time? It's also known um, by some writers as the Augustan period. And that's primarily used when referring to by English writers such as Pope and Swift, who were talking about the Roman Emperor Augustus. So there's four major ideas of the Enlightenment. We have reason, reason that it's basically saying we are not capable of understanding the truths of the universe. We are not able to know everything in terms of life and death and the beyond, which was primarily the religious dramas that preceded this time period. They're saying to accept this is to be reasonable and that we should explore what we can find as truthful. Um, they also emphasized order. They believe that there's order in all things. This is an, a scientific idea, right? Th this idea that there is an order in all things and all we have to do is figure it out through science, through physical the physical world. We can study it and we can find the order. They also believe that hierarchies are part of a natural order the pecking order, if you will. They also wanted stability. So in that idea, it, it had been a very tumultuous time proceeding. So we have this idea of stability and that nature itself is permanent and unchanging. Ancient people have the same basic nature as contemporary people is something that they believed. And then this idea of the general or the universal. Um, individualism or uniqueness are not valued in people. Standards of correct reason and taste are the same for all people. Those are the universal. And why? Why this obsession with reason and order? There had been war in Europe, tons of war in Europe preceding. Um, this time of the Enlightenment. So we have in France the Thirty Years' War. How long do you think it took? Thirty years, yes. Basically, it was German Protestant princes from France, Sweden, England, and Denmark, and other places were fighting against the Holy Roman Empire and the German Catholic nobility. So we have Protestants versus Catholics, and we have the Thirty Years' War. In England, we're having civil war in the Commonwealth period, um, Charles I is beheaded, and a Commonwealth government takes over. So we have lots of disorder, and it's all based on religious pursuits. And so they are reacting against that with this age of reason. So both England and France had experienced long periods of chaos. When the war in France and the Commonwealth period in England came to an end, people are ready for order. And this need for order is based on reason. Moliere. Moliere writes, the duty of comedy is to correct men by amusing them. So Moliere's actual name is Jean-Baptiste de Pocolin. His stage name is Moliere. He uh, was brought up by his family, and his father was a furnisher and upholsterer to King Louis XIV, the son king of France. His family was well-to-do, but is still apart from the royalty and the privileged aristocracy. Moliere, um, he was an educated man. He studied both philosophy and the classics. He, he took a law degree but he never practiced. Moliere decided at last minute to abandon his secure future. He could have been a furnisher and upholsterer as well. 
or he could have followed his law degree. Um, he changes his name to Moliere, okay? And he takes up a career in the theater. He changes his name so as not to scandalize his family. And he joins a company run by the Bejart family called the Illustre Theater. And uh, Commedia dell'arte, which you uh, might remember from the um, Italian Renaissance, is still going strong. There is also the Commedia Francois, and there is an actor friend of his um, who played Scaramucci, close friend of Moliere. So he joins this theater. It lasts for a year, and then the acting company goes bankrupt in 1644. Moliere had to actually be bailed out of debtor's prison because he couldn't pay his debts. If you couldn't pay your debts at that time, you would go to prison and have to basically uh, either be bailed out by paying off those debts or um, serve your time. He was forced to leave Paris for about 13 years, and he played in provinces and small towns. He, he basically was touring, a uh, touring itinerant actor. Um, he endured poverty and hardship on this traveling actor's life, and he eventually became director of what was left of the Béjart group. Then Moliere began writing plays. In 1658, Louis XIV saw Moliere's troupe acting in one of his comedies at the Louvre. The king, he was so impressed, he gave Moliere the use of a the theater. So suddenly, Moliere has the backing of King Louis XIV, the Sun King a great patron to the arts. And then comes Tartuffe. So he first produced Tartuffe, or The Hypocrite, in three acts at the theater in Versailles in 1664. Now the king liked to have the play read in court, um, in private, but he said, ha, 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 no, um, we're not gonna have this in public production. Um, Moliere wrote the play, rewrote the play again, but that was also deemed too irreverent. It, it basically, this play um, criticizes the church and the Holy Sacrament um, church at the time, and they didn't like that, and the king wasn't going to have a scandal on his hands. The Society of the Holy Sacrament thought that it was being satirized in Tartuffe, and they protested the play as a moral and an attack on the church. Um, but then in 1669, the Society of the Holy Sacrament is dissolved. Then there's a permit for the production of the play. It had immediate success with the populace. It is a satire on religious hypocrisy, which is timeless and meaningful across societies. Let's talk a little bit about um, in Tartuffe, it's written in rhymed couplets. The French verse is 12 syllables. They're called Alexandrines. So uh, unlike, similar in the unstressed and stressed, right, that we know in iambic pentameter, this, however, is an Alexandrine, so it is 12 rhymed couplets, 12 syllable rhyme couplets. Rhyming is much easier to do in French than English, so it's easy to do the heroic couplet again and again, which means the first line rhymes with the second. Uh, the unities. So remember, there's these neoclassical unities that are out there. Time, place, and action. Let's explore some of those, and what do those mean? Tartuffe follows these neoclassical unities, right? And this is what we're thinking of as a good play should have these. This makes a truthful play. Moliere observes the unities in Tartuffe, time, place, and action. The action takes place in one day. A realistic play should have the action take place in one day, according to the neoclassical unities, in one setting. We shouldn't be switching a bunch of locations. And no subplots, right? It's a unity of action. We want to follow the main plot. Here's a list of the characters. You're welcome to refer to this, but I encourage you now to go ahead and start reading Tartuffe. Enjoy it. It is a very fun comedy.